Okay, guys, I think we're gonna start because it's the chair's meeting at one. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today, uh, we have the first um, research seminar from 2018, and we have the honor of having uh, Dr. Hannah Fukudo, who is um, a faculty, new faculty from a new program called the Medical Molecular Biology uh, Graduate Program. It's a master's degree program for clinical laboratory scientists. And, and a little bit about uh, Hannah, she, um, uh, she has a PhD in cellular biology and, um, and where she worked with uh, C. elegans, right? And the olfactory yeah, sense. Smelling, and, yeah, smelling, basically. Yeah, it's not, when it says uh, by C. elegans, which is, is a, a worm that's used as a model organism. And, uh, um, and that was, um, and at, at Harvard, and then we, uh, she came here to Storybrooke, and she did a postdoc position at Jim Bliska's lab. Uh, that's our uh, one lab, and she started working on on, on your and pestis. And uh, she has been uh, teaching for the clinical laboratory science and the grad program for uh, like seven, seven years seven now. Years. And and I'm very happy to have her as a full faculty for the master's program. So thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to be here as well. So uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the work that I did uh, during my time in Jim Bliska's lab uh, as a postdoc. And uh, the title of the talk is Survival Strategy of Yersinia Pestis in the Host. So Yersinia Pestis is a bacteria um, that's most famous for causing disease called plague. And uh, um, the most famous one is probably Black Death um, that happened in the Middle Age uh, during, uh, in Europe. Um, there are three types of plague disease, uh, bubonic, septicemic, and uh, pneumonic. And uh, bubonic uh, plague is the most uh, popular or common form of plague. Uh, which is characterized by this uh, swollen lymph nodes or buboes um, that, uh, that can be found uh, near the site of infection. Uh, the infection happens by the uh, uh, flea that carries Yersinia pestis bacteria. And then when the flea bites, uh, the bacteria goes into the, um, the human or the animal host, and then uh, infection happens. And bubonic plague, uh, this uh, lymph node swells, and then you will have fever, headache, chill, um, and uh, have weakness. Uh, when the bacteria goes into the bloodstream, uh, it can cause septicemic form of plague, which is a lot more serious, and if, um, you can have uh, bleeding under the skin and um, uh, septicemia. Once the bacteria goes into the lung, it can also cause pneumonic plague, and this is the most uh, serious form of plague. And it's also very infectious because when you cough, uh, when you have the pneumonic plague, then uh, respiratory droplets can um, transmit to other humans and cause uh, another pneumonic plague. And if untreated, pneumonic plague can be uh, quite fatal. The mortality rate um, is pretty high uh, if untreated. Currently, we have antibiotic treatment. So as long as you treat it fast enough uh, with the antibiotics, uh, the mortality rate uh, is very uh, small. And um, in today's world, um, Yersinia pestis is, is pretty well controlled. Uh, however, uh, Yersinia pestis has been around uh, as long as we have been around and have been infecting uh, humans many times, uh, causing at least three pandemics. One is the Black Death that I talked about, and it wiped out about 60% of the European population. Uh, the other uh, pandemic uh, is Justinian plague, as well as the modern, modern plague, uh, both claimed uh, millions of people, right? Okay. Um, the transmission routes of plague is, uh, or Yersinia pestis is very interesting. So usually Yersinia pestis uh, is zoonic, uh, meaning that it 
lives uh, in the uh, host wild rodents. And uh, the insect vector or the flea can uh, suck up the blood of infected rodents and then transmit it to um, other hosts. And humans are accidental hosts where um, uh, the flea uh, that carries uh, Yersinia pestis uh, that came from the uh, infected rodents get transmitted into the humans and cause uh, bubonic plague. And then when the pneumonic plague starts, then human can transmit directly to other humans uh, by uh, coughing. So why do we study Yersinia pestis? Uh, as I said, uh, Yersinia pestis can be treated with uh, antibiotics nowadays. However, there are still uh, more than 1,000 cases of Yersinia pestis infection <coughs> each year, uh, mainly uh, in Africa, Asia, and South America, but also in the west part of the US. Um, it is a potential bioweapon because it's uh, very available in nature, and it can be highly infectious. There have been uh, antibiotic resistance strains, so you need to keep on making sure that we have antibiotics to treat the uh, Yersinia pestis infection. Currently, no effective vaccine is available uh, on the market, so again, uh, you need to do more research. And from the researchers, basic research point of view, uh, Yersinia pestis offers a nice model system to study interaction between the host and uh, the bacteria. So um, that's another reason we study. And uh, the last reason, uh, which kind of con uh, concerns myself, is that it's a nice, vet, uh, nice model to also study uh, the infection that goes through insect vector, because the Yersinia pestis uh, is transmitted by the flea. And we want to learn how bacteria adapt to both insect host and uh, mammalian host, and then you can go through different life cycle. Um, we want to know the mechanism for that. We also want to know how bacteria evolve to be able to do that, uh, go through different hosts to infect. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two projects. Uh, first, uh, we will talk about analysis of one single amino acid change that happened during the course of Yersinia pestis uh, evolution and see if this amino acid change has any effect on the virulence or the infectivity of Yersinia pestis. The other uh, project will be focused on identifying genes that are important <coughs> for survival of Yersinia pestis inside the host macrophage. Um, just a note, uh, so again, the work was carried out in Jim Bliska's lab uh, here at Stony Brook. And uh, the other thing I just want to mention is that we deal with attenuated strain of Yersinia pestis uh, that do not infect humans, so it's safe to, for us to work with it. Okay, so the first project, uh, I'm going to go uh, into some introduction and then I will describe uh, the, the project. So, um, as I said, Yersinia pestis has this life cycle where um, it resides in the rodent, and then it can be carried by flea to infect humans, and then it can cause either uh, bubonic plague, septicemic plague, or uh, when it gets worse, uh, pneumonic plague. But there are two other species of Yersinia that are also uh, pathogenic to humans, uh, which is uh, Yersinia enterocortica and Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. These are uh, soil-dwelling bacteria, and they cause mainly uh, mild gastroenteritis, and it's self-limiting so that it's not highly infective. So even though these strange species of Yersinia are related to pestis, they have very different lifestyle, very different virulence and infectivity. In particular, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis is very, very closely related to Yersinia pestis. And in fact, Yersinia pestis is considered to be a clone um, of uh, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, which 
only evolved from pseudotuberculosis uh, about 5,000 uh, to 70,000 years ago. So it's a very recent development that Yersinia pestis emerged. And by looking at this, you can tell that um, the lifestyle is completely different between Yersinia pseudotuberculosis and pestis, and the infectivity and the virulence are very different. So what we want to find out is how this bacteria evolved from such a kind of benign uh, enteric pathogen to a highly infective pathogen that goes through insect vector. And there have been a lot of studies on this uh, aspect. Um, we know that there have been a kind of inclusion of extrachromosomal plasmid that will add in, uh, kind of virulence characteristics to the bacteria. Uh, this P PCD1 uh, is actually common to all pathogenic Yersinia. So Yersinia pseudotuberculosis also has it. And this excretes toxins uh, that combat immunity by the ho human host. Um, another plasmid called PMT1 contains a gene that's essential for infecting uh, flea vector. So acquisition of this plasmid is one of the essential steps in becoming uh, insect-borne pathogen. There have been different genetic changes that have been discovered. Um, some of them are just one single DNA change, single DNA base change in the genome, which changes the protein that's coded by that um, gene, and that can change uh, the infectivity of the bacteria. For example, a mutation in PLA, uh, plasminogen activating uh, protein, pr protease, um, that uh, particular mutation has made it more infective to lungs of the, uh, of the host. Another uh, mutations in uh, genes called PDE genes um, enabled uh, flea to, I mean, bacteria to uh, infect fleas more easily. So there have been some genes that are known, but we want to find out more so that's where my um, project comes in. So here is a, kind of a, a evolutionary tree of Yersinia pestis. And these are uh, all the strains that are currently available, um, Yersinia pestis strains. And they have, based on the sequencing studies, they have built evolutionary trees. And here is the, um, the most uh, recent common ancestor of Yersinia pestis and pseudotuberculosis. So this is kind of the origin of the evolution. And then there, there are a lot of different strains that evolved from here. The, the, uh, the strains that are most similar to the uh, ancestral uh, strain of Yersinia pestis is, called, uh, is in the uh, uh, evolutionary branch zero. And this includes Microtus strain, which I'm going to talk about later. But this, these group, uh, this group of Yersinia strains are avirulent to humans. It is virulent. It can infect uh, animal, other rodent hosts, but not the humans to cause disease. But the more modern strains, uh, which include uh, Kim, uh, which is the laboratory strain that we use, um, and ESS strain that we are going to talk about. These um, all branches are more highly virulent, and it's virulent to humans as well. So you can see that it started with Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, and then it became uh, infective to uh, rodent host um, in an infect, uh, insect-borne way, but it's still a virulent to humans, and then it, the virulence developed towards humans as well. Um, during the evolution. Okay. So by comparing the sequence uh, of this group of uh, bacteria and this group of bacteria, in theory, if there are changes that happened in between, those changes might have contributed to the increased virulence of the modern strain. Okay. So this is kind of an an analogy. So if you have so this is evolutionary tree for the humans. If you look for the genetic changes between human, which is kind of like a modern strain of Yersinia pestis, and chimps, which is the older version, 
in a way, in a sense. Um, if there are genetic changes that are specific between these older ones and the humans, then maybe that's what makes us the humans. The same thing we can think about uh, with the microtus strain and ESS strain. Okay, ESS strain, I forgot to mention, is very close to the branch point between branch zero and all the rest of the branch. So it's the, the oldest strain among the new group of strain, the virulent strain. So by comparing this and older one, if there's a change, that could be potentially a significant change that made the, uh, the strain more virulent. Okay. So the ESS, it stands for East Smith Field Strain. Basically, this is a strain of Yersinia pestis that was recovered from the remains of the victim of Black Death pandemic. So they digged out the, uh, the, the grave of the Black Death uh, victims. They kind of uh, extracted DNA from the tooth of the, the big victims, and they found Yersinia pestis DNA there. They sequenced it. They were able to sequence that. And then they were able to compare this with both modern, like current strain, current uh, endemic strain of Yersinia pestis, as well as Microdus, um, which, is, which belongs to the uh, branch zero. The difference between uh, very recent strain and uh, ESS were very small, but there are some changes. And also they were able to find the difference between ESS and Microtus. And these, some of these changes might be important. That's our hypothesis. Okay. And when we compared these two um, strains, there was one change that was found in a gene called 4P. And uh, the change is G to A change between um, microtus or older strain and uh, more modern strain. And this changed amino acid sequence of, this, uh, of the encoded protein for P from G glycine to serine at the position to 15. Okay, it's just one single change in the protein. <coughs> for P is a transcriptional regulator and it's an important virulence factor. So for P is part of the system that uh, detects the change in the environment, such as low magnesium condition, which can be found inside immune cells, or uh, presence of antimicrobial peptides. And then it gets activated, and then it binds to um, the regulatory region of the DNA and controls the transcription of different downstream genes. And uh, this is important for the bacterial survival under low magnesium condition, resistance to antimicrobial peptides, and survival uh, inside immune cells. Okay. So the change in this uh, important regulator uh, could make bacteria behave slightly differently. Um, and that is what we wanted to test. So the hypothesis is that this change that happened between uh, ancestral strain of Yersinia pestis to the modern strain of Yersinia pestis might have had something to do with the in increased virulence of the bacteria. Okay. So we want to see if the function of this regulator gene uh, has changed between these two um, uh, variants and whether the Yersinia pestis, uh, uh, this has any um, relation to the increased virulence of Yersinia pestis. Okay, so the research strategy is we start from Kim strain, which is the laboratory strain that we use, which is very similar to ESS, the modern strain of Yersinia pestis. And then we introduce the change in 4P so that uh, now it has G to uh, glycine at this position, which is kind of equivalent to the um, older strain or the ancestral strain of Yersinia pestis. And we compare these two strains. In particular, we want to look at the 4P function 
So the, does it grow under low magnesium condition? Is it resistant to antimicrobial peptides? Is, um, is it able to uh, in, induce the transcription of re, uh, FOP regulated gene? And can, it, um, can the bacteria survive better uh, or worse in the uh, inside immune cells? So those are the things I tested. So the first growth under magnesi uh, low magnesium condition. So here, wild type is the modern one, the serine encoding for P. And then this is the mutant that we made, uh, which encodes glycine at the position 215 of 4P. And then this strain does not have 4P at all, okay, deletion of 4P. And we compared uh, the growth of bacteria at different con uh, con uh, condition. Um, as you can see here, at high temperature, at, uh, with a low magnesium condition, 4P, uh, the, the mutant strain that does not have 4P failed to grow. Wild type and this G215 uh, mutant can both grow. But if you look closely uh, for growth uh, rate at lower temperature, you can see that while um, wild type strain can grow faster and then deletion mutant does not grow very well. The mutant that has glycine at position 215 have reduced growth rate, okay? This does not happen if there's plentiful magnesium. So this suggests that uh, this change in uh, amino acid might have had something to do with growth under magnesium uh, limiting condition. Next, we looked at whether the transcription level of downstream gene, UGD, uh, has been affected by this mutation that we introduced. So again, this is the wild type or the S uh, serine uh, version of the uh, Yersinia pestis. Uh, under uh, 4P inducing condition, uh, it can induce uh, downstream gene UGD. If you don't have 4P, then you cannot induce UGD transcription. And if you look at here, you can see that 4P um, in the 4PG215 mutant, the transcription is reduced. Again, this suggests that glycine residue make it a little bit less active, make the 4P protein less active, and the modern version is a little bit more active. This does not, this change does not um, uh, influence the amount of protein, 4P protein that is made. So we think that this is due to the functional change in 4P protein. Next thing we looked at is resistance to antimicrobial peptides. Antimicrobial peptides is part of in, uh, innate immune system, uh, small peptides uh, that can disrupt cell membrane of the bacteria and kill the bacteria. And uh, these peptides are produced in many different organisms, including bacteria, which can produce polymyxin B, insect gut, so it, it would include flea gut, um, and also inside mammalian host uh, immune cells such as macrophages. So if 4P function is reduced and, um, in the mutant version, and if uh, resistance to this antimicrobial peptide uh, has changed, maybe that has something to do with the virulence. So, to, to test this possibility, we used polymyxin B, one of the uh, antimicrobial peptides, and see if uh, our strains are resistant or sensitive to treatment with uh, uh, polymyxin B. So what, I, what we do is called uh, minimum inhibitory concentration assay. Basically, you grow the bacteria in the presence of different concentration of the peptides and see at which concentration, um, the minimum concentration of antimicrobial peptides where the bacteria cannot, can no longer grow. So the higher the concentration, more resistant the bacteria is to the peptides. And if you can see here, wild type bacteria is pretty resistant to polymyxin B uh, with a high, higher minimum concentration here. But if you look at here, if you don't have 4P, 
you have a very sensitive strain. And if you lose uh, or if you change glycine residue, I mean, uh, if you have glycine at the critical residue, then again, you have very uh, enha um, enhanced sus susceptibility or decreased resistance. So this again shows that uh, the older version of uh, Yersinia pestis for P um, makes the bacteria a little bit more uh, sensitive to uh, antimicrobial peptides. And you know, this is the, uh, the idea is consistent with the, uh, the hypothesis that uh, G to S change that happened during the evolution might have made bacteria stronger, basically. So this was all good. Uh, what we wanted to see is if there's any more uh, in vivo uh, change. So if we infect uh, uh, the macrophage with bacteria, um, is there any change? So Yersinia pestis um, is uh, um, inter uh, it facultative intracellular pathogen, meaning it can survive both outside of uh, immune cells as well as inside immune cells. And um, we know that uh, we, we think that the ability of Yersinia pestis to uh, survive after being ingested by immune cells is an um, important part of the pathogenesis. We know that for P is plays an important part uh, in the survival of uh, the Yersinia pestis inside immune cells. So we wanted to see if this has changed uh, in the uh, 4PG215 mutant. So basically what we did was we grow up the bacteria, infected macrophage, and then uh, incubated uh, um, macrophage uh, for, for a while, and then enumerated the number of bacteria that survived inside the macrophage. If um, they can survive, the number should stay uh, if they were killed by macrophages, then the number should go down. And here, you can see that um, if you don't have 4P, the number of bacteria that's inside macrophage uh, decreases over time because the bacteria gets killed by the macrophage. Wild type is able to uh, remain uh, alive inside the macrophage. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see any difference between uh, the wild type and the mutant version of this new pestis. The next thing we wanted to see was whether this mutant strain uh, has different ability to infect flea. So flea, again, uh, is also supposed to uh, produce antimicrobial peptides. So if the strain is more sensitive to uh, antimicrobial peptides, maybe they will die uh, inside flea. So this is an experiment we did, or actually this was done by uh, our collaborator, uh, Viveka um, Babidalu at the uh, uh, Washington State University. Basically what she did was to mix wild type and mutant bacteria in one to one uh, ratio and put it into the blood meal. Flea ate this blood meal we waited for a couple of days, and then uh, crushed the infected flea, plated the inside, uh, determined the number of colonies created by either mutant or wild type bacteria, compared the number and see if any, uh, either one of them is uh, more competitive inside uh, the flea gut. Again, uh, so here's the ratio between wild type and the mutant uh, bacteria that was recovered from the uh, uh, gut of the flea. And here you're using uh, 4P215 mutant, and this is day zero, and this is day seven. The ratio remains around 50, suggesting that there's no competitive advantage in either wild type or the mutant uh, version of the strain. So again, uh, in vivo or in live organisms, uh, we haven't been able to show that the, this mutation has any effect. Okay. So but this then, is- I'm sorry, but sure. with the Delta, but the one that doesn't have 4P? Yeah, so the 4P, if you don't have 4P, 
this is what we found. Uh, basically, this means that wild type uh, uh, outcompeted the mutant. So the 4P is important for living inside, um, inside the flea. But this particular mutation effect is so small that we are not able to uh, find it uh, in our experiment. So the summary of this project, basically we created a mutation in a modern strain of Yersinia pestis to reflect um, the older or ancestral version of Yersinia pestis and compare these two strains for 4P-related functions such as growth under low magnesium condition, um, induction of the target gene, or resistance to antimicrobial peptides. And this uh, kind of artificial condition, we are able to find the difference between these two strains, suggesting that a uh, modern strain is stronger and more resistant to um, external stress. Um, this is <coughs> consistent with our original hypothesis is that um, the change in 4P gene might have contributed to the uh, increased virulence. However, we were not able to find significant difference in a more in vivo uh, real life condition. So um, either uh, this has nothing to do with evolution uh, or, or the virulence, or there is something uh, there, but the effect is so small that um, it doesn't get reflected in a more in vivo situation. So you need a combination of many genetic changes to see a more drastic change in the virulence. So this is uh, the kind of the conclusion for this uh, part of the, the talk. Okay. Uh, the second project uh, is uh, to look for more genes that are important in survival inside macrophage. And um, as I have shown this before, uh, bacteria, uh, Yersinia pestis has both extracellular phase and intracellular phase where uh, the bacteria are taken up by the macrophage. And uh, we think that the ability of the bacteria to survive inside macrophage might be important part of the Yersinia pathogenesis because this is presumed to happen at the beginning uh, when the bacteria goes into the host uh, um, animal or humans and then they get taken up by uh, immune cells. Okay. There have been a few genes that are uh, shown to be important for this process. 4P is one of them, and 4P is one of the most important uh, gene in this regard. Uh, but there are too many uh, that have been identified in Yersinia uh, to be in the, in, important for this process. So uh, our lab wanted to find more genes that are important for this process. So the question uh, we are asking this time is, what other Yersinia pestis factors are involved in promoting intracellular survival. What makes you think that it could have, what prompted you to do that? Because um, you already have some identified. Yeah, so yeah. So the, um, the reason is because uh, other bacteria, such as Salmonella and Regionella, that is known to survive inside macrophage, have a ways to modify uh, macrophage itself to kind of. Um, um, make it better condition for themselves. And uh, they have identified additional genes. Uh, some of these genes are kind of common in many bacterial pathogens, but they have found other things. So at the time, we thought that we could find more. So that's why we, we wanted to uh, look for more. And this is a project that was um, initiated by a former graduate student in the lab, Kate Klein. And Klein, and uh, what she hypothesized was that if the genes are essential for intracellular survival, um, then if you, if you put a mutation uh, or mutant bacteria through macrophage infection and then try to recover, they'll be dead, okay? So if you create a pool of mutants that has mutation in different genes and put it through macrophage, the ones that die are the ones that contain mutations in those essential genes. If you have, uh, if you grow these bacteria in just the regular culture media, they should all grow. So if you compare this population and this population, 
the ones that only survive in the culture media are the ones that contain the mutations in uh, essential genes inside macrophage. So that's the uh, rationale for her experiment. And she used microarrays to identify such genes. I'm not going into details for that, uh, but this is the list uh, of things that she discovered. And as you might see, 4P is one of the top genes that she found. Uh, PMR genes are uh, regulated by 4P, so it kind of makes sense that it's also there. And PMR gene is uh, responsible for modifying um, lipopolysaccharide uh, surface molecules of the, uh, the bacteria, so uh, it all made sense. And then she also found this gene called GAUU, and that's what she decided to focus her study on. And uh, this is the, uh, around the time I, I came in to kind of uh, join the project. So uh, she created a single mutant of Gao Yu uh, and tested if they, uh, the mutant really uh, dies inside macrophage. So at the beginning, we used the pool of mutants. So now we are using single mutant to see uh, if what we found is real. And yes, it is real. So if you uh, infect macrophage <coughs> with a um, strain that does not have GALU, then the, uh, the bacteria dies. And then if you put back GALU gene on a plasmid, then they can survive again. Okay? So this suggests, or this proves that um, GALU gene is important for the survival of uh, bacteria inside macrophage. What does GALU do? It's an enzyme. It encodes an enzyme that catalyzes um, a chemical reaction to add glucose um, uh, to, to, to uh, make UDP glucose. UDP glucose is an intermediate um, of um, LPS or lipid polysaccharide, uh, which is located outside of the bacterial surface. <coughs> and it is an important component of cell surface of the bacteria for resistance to, again, antimicrobial peptides. And um, U UDP glucose is important for synthesis of inner core part of the, uh, L uh, the polysaccharide, uh, as well as additional uh, modification, amino, uh, amino arabinose modification of uh, this uh, structure, which makes uh, this polysaccharide more resistant to uh, the action of poly uh, antimicrobial peptides. Okay. So knowing that, we wanted to see uh, whether GALU mutant is again uh, susceptible to uh, antimicrobial peptides. And again, we see, this, see that. So uh, wild type is highly resistant to the presence of antimicrobial peptides, but the GALU mutant is highly susceptible. And then if you put back GALU, then they will go back to resistance. Next, we wanted to see if the structure of uh, polysaccharides uh, are, have changed. So we ran a silver stain gel to see the, uh, the mobility of LPS uh, preparation uh, in different strains. So this is wild type, and this is GALU mutant. And this is a very subtle change, but do you see that the band shift um, or the mobility of the band has slightly changed? And then if you put back GALU into the uh, bacteria, it goes back to wild type, suggesting that there's some small change in the LPS structure of uh, GALU mutant. So we sent the sample off to uh, Robert Ernst at um, the University of Maryland who did mass spectral uh, photometry analysis on the LPS structure of both wild type and GALU mutant. And basically what he found is that the structure of LPS has been altered in the mutant. And specific changes that uh, amino arabinose modification that is necessary for antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance for the bacteria is missing in the GALU mutant. 
Finally, we wanted to see if this gene is important for infection uh, or virulence of the bacteria. So uh, we injected mice with 10,000, about, sorry, about 1,000 uh, bacteria, <coughs> either wild type or mutant, uh, into mice and monitored how many mice can survive each day after the uh, infection. So this is the plot of how many mice or how, how much percentage of mice are alive after days post-infection. And as you can see, the wild-type bacteria can kill mice pretty quickly. However, Gallu mutant, all the mice survived, suggesting that the Gallu, again, is very important for the virulence of the bacteria. <coughs> okay, so the summary for the second part, uh, we used a genetic screen method to try to identify genes that are important for intracellular survival of bacteria. And uh, we found GALU mutant, uh, which changes the LPS structure uh, uh, of the, uh, the bacteria and makes it more susceptible to antimicrobial peptides, makes it less virulent in mouse infection model. We also found another set of gene that is also involved in the structure of the surface of the bacteria. So, uh, and the 4P is also involved in this um, surface structure of the bacteria. So at the end, our conclusion is that the surface molecules of the bacteria are very important for resistance of the bacteria to antimicrobial peptides and also the um, ability of the bacteria to survive into, uh, inside the macrophage. And this is uh, a common feature that can be found in many intracellular uh, bacterial pathogens. So uh, that's the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, I want to thank uh, both past and uh, present members of Bliska Lab, as well as, of course, Jim. Uh, I was there for more than 10 years, so I have seen a lot of people go through, and uh, I really enjoyed being there. Um, especially Kate uh, has initiated the project too, and Lance uh, helped us with the data analysis of the mutant. Uh, Galina helped me with the uh, silver stain gel. Joe uh, actually was the first person who kind of uh, got me into uh, the other project number one, which is the sequence comparison uh, of the Yersinia strains. And we have a, a number of collaborators outside of here. Uh, Viveka from uh, Washington State University uh, has done a flea infection for us. And then uh, Robert Ernst from University of Maryland has done mass spec analysis. Henry Pointer and Edward Holmes are the ones who compared the strains um, Yersinia pestis genomic uh, sequence between Microtus and ESS. And then Bruce Futcher from this university helped us with the uh, uh, genetic screen. And the uh, reagents and mouse work were helped uh, by these people. And I want to thank everyone uh, from here as well as CID uh, for, us, for the support. Thank you. So I thought uh, we might enjoy knowing how uh, Galina helped with the, uh, the, the macrophages, where you get the macrophages from for infections. Can you explain how? Oh, yeah. So the macrophage. Uh, is isolated from bone marrow of the mice. So they, uh, Galina, our uh, technician, uh, isolate uh, undifferentiated macrophage or the immune cells from the bone marrow, uh, differentiate on the plate or in vitro, and then we put, the, uh, put that on the plate, and then we put bacteria on top of the um, differentiated macrophage, and macrophage will engulf the bacteria, and that's how we do the infection assay. So she strikes the, the femurs that are like yeah. this big, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. gives you uh, yeah. I, I, how many experiments? <laughs> yeah, I have to say I never did that uh, in 10 years of my postdoc experience there, so. <laughs> I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so just generally speaking from a translation uh -huh. perspective, if a flea bites you, yeah. what determines whether the vector really gets conveyed to the host? So, um, one 
mechanism is a biofilm formation. So bacteria can replicate and grow in numbers inside the, uh, the gut of the flea. And then it kind of forms a uh, tight biofilm inside the gut or the, uh, or the throat of the uh, infected flea. And it kind of uh, suffocates the flea. And so because it cannot eat and it cannot, um, um, yeah, it can, the, the flea cannot eat no longer, so it kind of tries to get the bacterial biofilm out. So when it bites another host, it tries to get the, the blood, uh, the bacteria out, and that's how it gets transmitted. And, and is that bolus enough? Uh, what is, is is that much vector? Yeah, and then you don't. Yeah, yeah and uh, the real virulent uh, Yersinia pestis only needs a uh, couple of bacteria to infect host. So you only need a few, and you know right. the the chunk is enough to do because that. Because from uh, Wei for yeah, Wei's work, it was huh? like she had to crush a lot of fleas. Oh uh, yes. So yeah, no, no, that's that's, that's to one. make sure that uh, some fleas. Um, taking uh, bacteria, some fleas, even though it's still it's eating the blood that contains the bacteria, sometimes they don't, you know, get the um, enough number of bacteria. So that's why they have to do this. But um, in real life, they kind of spit out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a, a one question oh. that you know, aim one and aim two. Uh -huh. So to look for the to look for the virulence of the bacteria into the into the bodies, right? The first name you use the flea, and the second name you use the mice. Yeah. So can you explain what was the reason of changing the species from flea to mice? And uh, we, uh, yeah. So we are actually specialized in macrophages and mice, and uh, we have my project uh, was to look for genes that are important for survival inside macrophages in particular. Uh, that's what we were interested in. But uh, later we found that for P might be. In, uh, important in the flea vector uh, infection. And also because we were not seeing any um, sort of phenotype in the macrophage infection, we wanted to see if you, know, if you look at the, uh, the other host, do you see any difference? So that's why we kind of added uh, flea analysis later. Uh, but there are, there are people who specialize in flea infection who um, like us, uh, specialize in the mice, and we kind of combine our knowledge together to kind of make a whole picture. So do you think that you will get uh -huh. the same findings if you have used the flea in the A for the A2? Probably not. So they have, I, I don't think they have done the same experiment, but they looked at the genes that are induced inside macrophages versus inside flea. And there are some overlaps, but not all of them overlap. There are some flea specific Yersinia pestis genes that are induced, and then uh, Yersinia pestis genes that are specifically induced in macrophages. So um, those genes are probably more specifically involved in one way or the other. So different mechanisms, I would I say. One last question. Sure. So uh, if, you, uh, if, you take the, if you look at the proportion of the, uh, the vectors which are causing this, uh, which contributes more, the rodents or the flea in spreading this disease? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, you have to have rodent populations that are constantly infected and then the flea. As, a, as a reservoir, okay. but the flea is the one that carries it to humans. Mm -hmm. So I think flea is also critical. Okay. Yeah, that's my, my guess. So one of the um, things with the IPC that you guys might be interested in, one of the points is uh, collaboration yes. and authorship. Uh -huh. Since you have collaborated uh -huh. with so many groups, uh, can you, um, can you tell us uh, sure, so sure. how so, do you do when uh, you know you ask someone to collaborate? How do you do with the sure. authorship? Sure. So the first project started out with a sequencing project where uh, people compared two different strains of bacteria. Um, and they found the difference. So they wanted to know what the difference meant in terms of virulence. But they were more specialized in sequencing of the genome, but they were not specialized in uh, infection. And also, we happened to be um, working on this gene called 4P for a long time before the sequencing project happened. And I, I was one of them who uh, really uh, was working on 4P. So that's why they contacted us and said, 
here's an interesting change, do you want to analyze it? So that's how we got into uh, the, uh, the project. And so the original sequence was done in another lab. Joe was kind of in between, so that's how we got this um, project. And then I worked on characterizing different uh, aspects of Bopi. And then we, we weren't able to get any um, difference in macrophage infection. And that's when we asked Vibeka, uh, who is specialized in flea infection, and see if there's anything we can find in a flea infection. So that's how the collaboration happened in the, um, the first project. And all, all of us are uh, together uh, as an author for the, for the paper. Um, Okay, so that like first author, senior author. Yeah, so uh, I am listed as the first author because I did all the characterization. The sequencing project was actually published before this, uh, in actually a nature paper. So um, that part is kind of taken care of, and that's why uh, they were not uh, insistent on uh, being an author for this project. Um, Vivica kind of came in at the, the towards the second half of the project to look at the flea. So she's um, listed as kind of a uh, last to sec second to last author. And then Jim, who's my boss, who brought in the money and the equipment and all the uh, resources to do this research is listed as the corresponding last author. Uh, the second project was uh, started by Kate. So Kate is the first author. But uh, she had to leave because she graduated and she finished other projects. She, she was ready to leave, <laughs> so she went. And, um, but there were unfinished projects, so that's uh, kind of what I finished off. And it became more than we thought at the beginning. And so that's why I was listed as co-author, co-first author of this project. So I'm listed second, but I'm uh, a co-first author of this project. And then uh, Robert Ernst, um, did the mass spec, so she, he's also listed. And again, uh, Jim is the, um, the last author. Those are the most challenging ones, right? <laughs> Where you do some portion of the work and then you just say, I'm leaving. Yeah. And then people behind you have to clean up for you. <laughs> yeah. And as you go through the process... It, it, it somehow like it the, worked really yeah, well for us. Yeah, um, the thought will cross yeah. you at least 10 times that don't I deserve the first <laughs> here? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't... I, we had a really good people around us. So I didn't, I never had to Finally. insist on my position in the paper. And basically, uh, Kate and Jim offered uh, towards the end that, you know, you have done enough to, to deserve the co-author. So I didn't, I really didn't have to do anything, but it, I know that it becomes yeah. problems. Even in our lab, it has been difficult sometimes. So. So how much, how much time does it take if you start the project and at the point you reach the publication stage? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so this, uh, yes, for, uh, so the first project, the first time I heard about this project was 2012. And then I worked on it for uh, maybe part-time, because at that point I was working on some other projects. I did part-time on this one for maybe a year or so, and I got stuck and people lost interest, so we kind of stopped for a few years. And then somehow uh, we got another grant that supported this project, so we came back to it, and then we just finished, like, last month. So, <laughs> so that's how long it took for this one. The other one was a little shorter, but it's, it's a long process. Yeah. Oh, no. I just got published. I got last month. Yeah, yeah, oh, accepted, no problem. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, yes. All right, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming.